Welcome back, and we're here having a conversation with Ian Gawler. Ian, before the break, we were talking about part of your journey, which obviously led you to setting up the Ian Gawler Foundation. How long ago was that? Uh, well, I started running groups in 81, Robin, mm -hmm. um, and I guess just to fill in the, the gap, um, I had my leg amputated in 75, and, mm -hmm. but then the cancer reoccurred later that year. And uh, at that point, there wasn't any obvious conventional medicine that could uh, really help. And, oh, okay. and I had a prognosis of about three to six months. Really? And, uh, you know, as a vet, I'd been into the medical libraries and I, I hadn't been able to find a re an account of anybody who'd lived more than six months with that situation. So, um, again, in that sort of pragmatic way, I thought, well, if I'm going to survive this, obviously something, I've got to do something different. I've got to mm -hmm. look somewhere else. Uh, and I think there, again, I was helped. I, I had the belief through my veterinary work that there's this quite powerful healing potential that I'd seen at work in animals. And there's the same in people that, given the right circumstances, you know, there's an incredibly strong drive within a, a physical body to heal itself. And I thought perhaps there's a way that that can be helped in, in, in the face of, you know, what was really quite a, um, a, a difficult cancer. And so that led me on to looking at how you could use nu uh, nutrition therapeutically uh, into meditation and the power of the mind and you know, all those things that I guess now we think of as being to do with holistic medicine. <coughs> where, was it, where did the cancer reappear? Um, well, it came inside my pelvis, inside my chest. Um, it, it spread through my left lung and then it, it actually broke out on the surface of my chest. And you're given three to six months? Yeah, well, that was a pretty realistic sort of uh, estimate. And I, and I deteriorated quite a bit before I got better. So at my worst, my key doctor thought I'd probably live for a couple of weeks. And that was in 76, so it's been a good few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we won't do the arithmetic. So you brought in what, change of diet? What was yeah, that you brought um, in for you? I, well, I was really fortunate because I was around in those sort of pioneering days of mind-body medicine yep. and... Yeah, you know, what in a way were almost more revolutionary days of nutritional medicine, um, and 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 probably more secret days of um, spiritual healing and spiritual medicine, mm -hmm. um, because all of those things became important, and and I was fortunate because I had a veterinary background, so I had a sort of a medical understanding, so I could sort of dance my way through those things, and I could also talk to my doctors about what options were available to me medically, um, and really did have an opportunity through my own situation to test you know, most of the conventional, the not so conventional and some of the really far out sort of things because um, you know, my, it took a couple of years to recover. Um, and, and so I, what happened was I got a chance to work out or sort out what worked and what didn't. Uh, and then when I recovered, I thought, well, I've had this extraordinary experience. You know, I've had a really difficult cancer. I've, I've been through a whole range of things. Um, I've learned things that I feel clearly helped me to recover um, that really made a difference in my own outcome. And I, and I thought, well, perhaps it might help other people. So when I recovered, I first went back into my veterinary work. Um, but then this idea of starting a, you know, what was essentially a self-help um, program um, was, was, was brewing. And uh, in 1981, I was living back in the Yarra Valley and, and had this idea of starting a group in Melbourne itself and thought that um, at the time, you know, people were really conscious of all the problems that cancer posed, but there was nowhere really where you could go and find out what solutions might be available. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, we don't need to dwell too much on the problems. We'll, we'll sort of have a more solution-based approach to it. Um, and to consider what people can do for themselves because, you know, in the medical system there were lots of things being done to or for people, but they were giving no account, really, in all fairness, they were giving no account to what the person could do themselves. And they were basically saying to people, if you're diagnosed with cancer and medicine can't help you, then forget it. You it's know? a death sentence, that's yeah. what... Yeah, and and a lot scene. of people were given bad news really badly in those days. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it still happens too much, I, I'm of the view. I think that it, it disappoints me that you know a lot of the, particularly the specialists, still haven't worked out how to communicate bad news well, which I think is eminently possible. And um, 
I, I hear from a lot of people who really suffer, particularly through the lack of hope that's engendered by being given bad news badly. But anyway, in, in those early days, what I was really interested in was how can you actually combine the best of what medicine's got to offer with the best of what the, the, the patients got to offer and their families can do in support. And I, I guess it was like a fairly simple model. I mean, if you, if you wanted to learn about a computer, you'd go off to computer school. You know, mm -hmm. if you wanted to, or you'd get a, you know, you'd read the manual or you'd study it a bit. If you wanted to learn how to play golf, you'd, you'd think it was natural to take lessons and practice and you'd get better at it. And 25 years ago, if people got cancer, they thought, all I can do is take my chances. There's no point in trying to learn anything. There's nothing to learn. And uh, you know, my own experience had demonstrated for me personally that what I'd been able to learn through all the great teachers I'd come across, you know, all the people who had helped me with different aspects of this, had really made the difference between life and death. Well, let's just talk a little bit about that. You had surgery, would yeah. that be correct? How much surgery did you undergo? Uh, well, I just had the amputation. Yeah, so that you didn't have any surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, Robert. You didn't have any uh, any surgery though for when it came back the second time. I, I thought you had. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't um, amenable to that. Okay. And that was that was the difficulty when it when it when it recurred. There really wasn't any medicine of the day that was curative. So I I, I did have some radiotherapy um, after about three months, um, in the hope that that would alleviate some of the pain I was experiencing. Very painful cancer, the one I had too. And, um, Did you have chemotherapy also? And then about a year later, um, when I was already past my use by date, <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing reasonably well because I was still alive, but the cancer was still quite present. In fact, it had been growing over that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd sort of been con controlling it somewhat, but I hadn't really been able to get on top of it through these more natural things like the diet and the meditation. Okay. Um, and so I went back to the doctors after about a year and I mean I think they were still pretty amazed that I was alive firstly mm -hmm. but then secondly I had quite extensive secondary osteogenic sarcoma and I had no pain that was bothering me and I had no physical signs of it apart from these lumps of cancer all over the place and, and both those things were quite remarkable. Um, but. I just had an inner sense that it was getting out of hand, that the cancer was actually slowly progressing and I needed something that could combat it more directly. More orthodox? Well, I think for me that was what was needed actually yeah. because I'd, you know, I'd, I'd been trained in the veterinary model which is like the human medical model and I think for me in those days it was quite hard to really deeply believe that things like meditation, nutrition, the power of the mind would be enough to turn around something as aggressive and physical as an osteogenic sarcoma. Um, so I, I think when I went back to the doctors and said, well, is there anything else we can do? And they said, well, there's the experimental chemotherapy that's just coming into the country that might be worth trying. It's got a whole range of side effects and we don't know if it'll work, but if you want to give it a go, you can. Uh, I think for me, I, I approached it uh, with two thoughts in mind. One was that it might help physically, but I thought it might also help my mind to believe more in the fact that I really could recover. Um, and so I embarked on a course of chemotherapy, but after a couple of months, again, I, I, I got a real deep inner sense that whatever benefit I could get from that treatment I'd, I'd received, mm -hmm. and although I was being recommended to keep on with treatment for a long time, uh, I elected to stop it at that point. It very much against the advice yeah, well-meaning advice, and I was, you know, with of the, of the specialist who was helping me at the time, and um, you know, and I think in retrospect, obviously, it worked to do that, and I, and I think that's one of the other things that was coming out of this that, that that part of the difficulty in cancer medicine these days is that a lot of treatments actually are very difficult equations. You know, they've got <laughs> benefits that might only be marginal when you look at the scientific evidence that support them and side effects that can be quite significant and quite um, difficult for the person who's going through the treatment. And so you've got to benefit these small, you've got to balance these small benefits against quite difficult side effects. Mm. And they're very hard decisions to make. And uh, again, I think what, what we're seeing is a, a real need for the doctors to talk through those situations with the, the persons involved and help to draw out of them what they can put their 
um, mind to uh, and what they believe is good for them and try and develop this more intuitive way of actually making those decisions because rationally they're not actually easy ones at all. And so for me, I, because of all that I'd been doing and particularly because of the solid base of meditation that I had, I had a real confidence in that inner awareness and that sort of inner sense of um, more wisdom-based, intuitive way of uh, making decisions. Mm -hmm. So I, I was very keen to look at the science and use the logical, rational, sort of left-sided part of the brain, but I, I, for me it was also important to trust that more wisdom-based, intuitive, right brain sort of problem-solving. And so when I got to that point where I, I'd had a couple of months of chemotherapy, there was this very strong sense that that was enough, and so I elected to stop it. Okay, well, we'll take another break and then we'll come back and perhaps find out more about what you did with the more spiritual wisdom, intuitive based.